Hey everyone, welcome back to the Prime 5, your 5 biggest Nintendo news stories in the last 24 hours. Or as our Monday episode goes, the 5 biggest stories from the last 48 hours, because we're dealing with the freaking weekend, everyone. Woo! Let's get going into today's news. So our first story deals with a Splatoon 3 data mine from infamous data miner Oatmeal Dome. He put this out on Twitter a couple days ago and he noted that there are three new game modes in the data for Splatoon 3 when it comes to Salmon Run. So these modes are Pair, Underground, and Contest. Pair and Underground apparently have their own pay grades and titles. Underground will have higher quotas as well. So as in wave one will have plus three, wave two will have plus five, wave three will have plus seven, which are just higher than the normal amounts of eggs you must collect. The modes could be part of occasional events such as Big Run. For those who don't know what Big Run is, that's the mode where occasionally they try to take over Splatsville and you do Salmon Run in the multiplayer stages. Now this hasn't actually been activated in the game yet but it has been teased by nintendo as something that happens once every few months it's really cool just to have some of this data out there why these modes haven't been officially confirmed that announced by nintendo yet is beyond me maybe they're just waiting to announce the very first ever big run so i guess we'll just have to wait and see we have some brand new news for sonic frontiers coming out of tokyo game show and that news seems to revolve around well how the switch version actually performs so this is according to somebody who talked to a Sega employee on the floor. We'll put a link to all these sources. It will run at 720p and 30 FPS. That is the target for Sonic Frontiers on Nintendo Switch, supposedly. Not confirmed, but this is what a Sega representative supposedly said. Now, another thing also noted, and this is official because it comes from an interview about Sonic Frontiers, is how difficult the boss fights are going to be. This comes from Sonic Frontiers director Morio Kishimoto, who said, Normally in Sonic games, you'll encounter a boss and you'll fight them as a regular blue Sonic. In Sonic Frontiers, there will be bosses that blue Sonic can't even scratch. But if he collects and uses all seven Chaos Emeralds, he can become Supersonic and then battle those bosses. Becoming Supersonic will be the only way to fight them. Up until now, in Sonic games, Supersonic would only appear against the last boss. Imagine if the first boss in Sonic Frontiers is as strong as those bosses. Clearly indicating that there was a big emphasis on boss fights in this game and making them significantly more difficult than in the past. So I find that to be really, really cool. The 720p 30 FPS, you know, a little disappointing. I, you know, Sonic to me always seems to play better at 60, but hey, you know what? I'm not going to judge it until it's out. There was a little bit of drama over the weekend between Kit and Krista, former Nintendo employees, and Joe Merrick, who works for Cerebi.net, and it revolved around the Pokemon Company and Nuzlocke, which, what? What are we even talking about? What the heck is a Nuzlocke? Well, here is how it goes. And this is according to Kit Ellis from the Kit and Krista grouping that used to run Nintendo Minute. Well, we have a great story to tell about this, where we thought that this would be a fun idea for a Nintendo Minute video. So we pitched it to the Pokemon company and said, hey, we would like to do a Nuzlocke run. What do you think? Here's what we think. Bam! So they said, we consider this to be the same level as using hacking. ROM hacks. Excuse me? This is just a style of playing the game that everybody can buy. There's no hacking. You're just playing the game. That was truly one of the more like, wait, what? Now, context here, because I don't know that everyone knows what Nuzlocking is. It's just self-imposed rules that you use to beat the game or do certain challenges in the game, similar to, say, a three-heart run in The Legend of Zelda series, where people will choose not to upgrade their hearts, and you just try to beat the game with three hearts. Joe Merrick of Cerebi.net claims he has talked to the Pokemon Company International, so TPCI, and no, they don't cut people out or liken this apparently to hacking. Now, conclusion is, I don't think that anybody's actually lying and everyone's probably correct. Kid Ellis is likely telling the truth about their experience with the Pokemon Company and how someone there just really didn't want this to be shown in some sort of official light. And yes, the Pokemon Company doesn't care if the general public does it. 
In fact, nobody, as far as we're aware, has ever been banned or blocked for doing a Nuzlocke run that wasn't involved hacking the game. So, like, if you hack the game to create a Nuzlocke run, yes, they are against that. But anyone who doesn't hack the game and just puts self-imposed rules on themselves, well, you know, hey, they're not really upset at you. Like, as an example, you can never use upgraded Pokeballs. You know, they don't really get upset with you, right? So... Yeah, I like to think that no one's really lying here. I can see how the Pokemon company, maybe in an official capacity, doesn't want to do it. Maybe the particular employee they talked about, there was something lost in translation where they thought the Nuzlocke run was going to be one of the hacked runs. I don't know. Either way, I think both are end up telling the truth. I think everyone's being honest. And the truth is somewhere in the middle, as always. So speaking of weird things over the weekend, well, we get to talk about some interesting leaker news. It's kind of weird that we're covering leaker news, but it's because we cover these people so often, I thought this was important to mention, especially since the biggest name in Nintendo leak history is retiring. Emily Rogers is stepping away from leaking games so she could focus on her family and other passions in her life. That does mean that Metroid Prime Remaster HD is the final game that she has leaked, and she does say it is still coming. She just doesn't know when. Also, in terms of just rumors in general, she is the one who is the source on Nintendo's working on several GameCube remasters and remakes for the end of Switch's life. Didn't specify any specific games, so take that for what you will, but Metroid Prime is obviously one such game. All good things must come to an end eventually. She did note a bunch of people we can continue to follow, such as Jeff Grubb and Tom Phillips and Jason Schreier and Nate Drake, and even had in the past has mentioned Zippo as a possible insider because Zippo is releasing information she's hearing about. It's just way too early to talk about, and maybe that's Zippo's entire problem, is that he's releasing information way too early. That being said, that's not the only insider news we have because Jeff Grubb addressed his Nintendo Direct rumors. He was the source on the Wind Waker in front of the Princess HD that people got really mad about. Now he got a bunch of other stuff right, but that's kind of besides the point because people are really, really not forgiving him for Wind Waker and Twilight Princess. So he admits that he did not verify the source on the Wind Waker and Twilight Princess, which is something he usually does do. He didn't because he got caught up in the hype and thought it made too much sense. He became aware quickly that he didn't clarify properly that this was unverified information. He made the decision to ride the wave and deal with the L if it happened. He will never talk about unverified stuff again. He clarified, as we have, that he never said Metroid Prime HD would be in the show, only that he made a guess he is still hearing this holiday for a release. He also gave content creators credit for what he has sourced and what is just a guess. He thinks this has gotten a lot better since people started covering him a year ago. He's mostly sorry to the fans because the Wind Waker and Twilight Princess is directly on him and highly sought after. He also said that he understands if this breaks the trust, if this makes people no longer trust him, if you guys don't like hearing about Jeff Grubb anymore. He's taken the L. He's taken it on the chin, and he agrees that absolutely... He did break your trust, and you should have a problem with him. So that's what he's saying. He's saying all the right things. Personally, we're still going to obviously cover Jeff Grubb because, again, he was right on most of the stuff for the direct. But still, mistakes happen, and this seems to be one of them. And hopefully this is just a lesson he promises moving forward. So he claims that he will never talk about things that are unverified like that again, especially in a more official capacity. Only time will tell. Our last story is about Octopack Traveler 2 because 20 minutes of it were shown off at Tokyo Game Show and you're seeing some now and honestly, it looks absolutely incredible. The first Octopath Traveler game was really damn good and even the prequel they did on mobile phones, honestly, if, if I'm just being straight with you guys, it's actually pretty good. I, you know, I kind of was shocked when they did the whole mobile phone thing, but to be fair, it's not that bad. And now, obviously, we have a direct sequel. Well, sort of. It's a sequel, anyways. I don't know if it's direct. We have, obviously, eight new stories to go through. We don't really know how everything connects together with the first game or with the prequel yet because we, obviously, haven't gone hands-on with it. That being said, I am Nathaniel Rebeljance from Nintendo Prime. I want to thank all of you guys so much for tuning in. Hopefully, you enjoyed today's episode. So, hopefully, I'll see each and every one of you there.